12 men have just discovered something. For 100,000 years, it was buried in the snow and ice. Now it has found a place to live, inside. John Carpenter's The Thing is truly a classic of the genre that is much more appreciated now, 40 years later, than it was on initial release. It constantly gets listed amongst the greatest the genre ever had, and we've covered it a fair bit on the channel with a deconstructing of it as a whole, and a peek at what the fuck happened to its malign 2011 prequel. It's my favorite horror film of all time, and I already discussed its forgotten video game sequel from 2002, but now we're going to look at its very roots. Get the blood test ready as we take a look at what the fuck happened to this adaptation. The Thing is a 1982 horror film brought to us by master of horror John Carpenter. Carpenter was coming off three straight profitable and critically approved movies with Halloween, The Fog, and Escape from New York when he was given a huge budget for his first true studio project. Carpenter's name had been involved since the mid-1970s, even though he only had his student film Dark Star to his credit. Universal balked at that and wanted Toby Hooper and his writing partner Kim Henkel to get a go at crafting the film, but eventually they lost out as the studio wasn't a fan of their approach. Eventually it fell back to Carpenter, but with a larger focus on the original source material rather than remaking the Howard Hawks produced 1951 original. This was seen as kismet as Carpenter was a huge fan of Hawks and even modeled his siege film Assault on Precinct 13 on Hawks' own Rio Bravo. Bill Lancaster would be brought in to do the script, even as Carpenter and longtime friend Kurt Russell helped add ideas to it. Carpenter also brought his frequent collaborator Dean Cundy to shoot the film, and instead of writing the score himself, which he usually does, these duties fell to Italian legend Ennio Morricone, who would later win an Academy Award for The Hateful Eight with unused and remixed sections of his own score for this movie. The cast was incredible in the film, but nearly none of them were the first options. Kurt Russell, in fact, was the last person to be cast, with Universal throwing out names like Christopher Walken, Jeff Bridges, and Tom Atkins. McCready wasn't the only character with lots of options, though. Childs was almost played by Bernie Casey, Carl Weathers, and even Isaac Hayes, with Ernie Hudson being a frontrunner until Keith David was eventually cast. Palmer was seen as the comedy relief, so the studio naturally sought after Jay Leno, Gary Shandling, and Roger Rabbit himself, Charles Fleischer, but ultimately David Clennon won the role over with his ability to play the serious notes a little bit better. Finally, Gary, the leader of this very different cast of men, was almost played by Jerry Orbach, Lee Van Cleef, and Powers Booth before Donald Moffat eventually became the station's commander. With the cast in place, filming began on August 24th, 1981, with a budget that would eventually reach $15 million, a high for a John Carpenter film, and his first big studio effort. The film would release on June 25th, 1982, and would eventually gross over $19 million. You gotta be fucking kidding. While the film generally has the reputation of being a massive flop, the truth is it was neither a flop nor a hit, even if it was still a disappointment. Who Goes There was written by John W. Campbell Jr. and was published in 1938 in the collection Astounding Stories. Campbell used the pen name Don A. Stewart for its first run. It was also listed under the alternate title The Thing from Another World, which would be used in the story's first adaptation in 1951. Campbell's career spanned from 1930 with the publication of numerous short stories and would run all the way up to his death in 1971. He released eight novels with his first coming in 1933 with Beyond the End of Space and his last one in 1966 with The Ultimate Weapon. He was a skilled editor during his entire career with some claiming him to be science fiction's greatest editor, including for Isaac Asimov. In addition to the main eight novels, Campbell would release four short story collections from 1948 to 1966, with an additional four coming post-mortem. Discussing Campbell the Man is a little more complicated. While not as well known to be the horrifyingly menacing racist that H.P. Lovecraft was, Campbell had a lot of outwardly awful thoughts on slavery, even going on record saying that it gave them a better life than they had in Africa. Woof. He also had no sympathy for the Watts rioters and argued to keep schools segregated because... Well, honestly, I don't even want to type it out or say it, but go look him up if you need the exact details. In addition to those lovely thoughts, he was not exactly a believer in most medicines and argued that there was absolutely no way to tie smoking to any kind of illnesses. Sure. He would also take his own genre a bit too serious and believed in pseudoscience, including something called a Dean Drive that would go against the known laws of physics. Okay, so this is definitely a case of separating the art from the artist. He would live to see the 1951 movie adaptation, but no others, nor would he see his fully realized version be published, but more on those later. 
So now let's get into the actual adaptation. How did Carpenter and team do? Well, the story opens up at Big Magnet Research Complex in Antarctica at the tail end of winter. The 37 men stationed at the Big Magnet stumble across a spaceship that has been buried in the ice for millions of years. When they try to excavate it with a thermal charge, basically the equivalent to fishing with dynamite, the ship itself is destroyed, but they do come across at least one of the crew members who was frozen in the ice while they surmise it was looking for heat. The movie, on the other hand, opens with the now infamous crazy Swedes in a helicopter trying to kill a dog that looks to seek shelter at US Outpost Number 31 in the first week of winter, a station that now only has a total of 12 men. One of the later to be found out Norwegian men blows up his own helicopter while the other one continues to shoot after the dog until the head of the base, Gary, deposits a bullet into his brain. The dog handler Clark takes the dog inside to help it as they patch up researcher Bennings who was shot in the leg by the rifle-toting Norwegian. The group discovers that there's a camp where the two men must have come from and send Doc Copper and chopper pilot McCready to investigate. They find mostly destroyed ruins, some bodies, a huge square chunk of ice, and finally burned remains that they can't identify. So if you're keeping track so far, the differences include the names of the stations, the number of inhabitants, how they discover the thing in the first place, the Norwegian camp, you know, existing, and then some of the characters are different. McCready is second in command, not a pilot, and a lot of the characters, although the names are the same, are very different from book to film. The alien in the book thaws out, virtually bringing it back to life, and it kills and reproduces an imitation of one of the researchers named Conant. It attempts to do the same thing with the sled dogs of the compound before it's caught by the remaining scientists and killed before it can complete its replication of the dogs. One of the scientists named Blair goes insane from paranoia and guilt as he was the one that pushed hard for the creature to thaw out in the first place, and he's locked in a cabin as to not put anyone else in danger, something he absolutely threatens to do. Finally, they opt as a team to destroy their own vehicles and not raise any alarms on the radio as to get a search party or rescue team sent after them. The men of the film find the new dog they took in attempting to kill and absorb the other dogs, but stop it with straight up bullets and eventually a flamethrower. The first remains had normal sets of human organs, and these remains are found to be able to perfectly replicate any cellular organism they want. It's here in the film that three of the men go to the crash site of an alien ship that they found with the notes and the tapes of the Norwegian camp. Movie Blair runs a simulation and finds that all of Earth is at risk if this still alive creature makes it to civilization. He goes a little crazy and kills the remaining dogs as well as makes all the vehicles and radios inoperable before he's put into isolation. Blair in both mediums is the one that goes a little nutty first and is isolated in both, but while the story has a suspicious member immediately after, the movie characters suspect nothing. The creature of the book also begins its assimilations by devouring its victim, while the movie counterpart seems to dissolve its prey. The other stark difference is Movie Blair taking matters into his own hands, while the men of the book come to the decision as a group to isolate the base with no means of escape. Back to the book team, who now decides they have to figure out how to find out how many of them are compromised by the alien creature, now being known as the eponymous thing. They decide a blood test can discern who is and isn't human, but when they attempt to test it on a sled dog, they're surprised to find that both human and alien blood were used in the test, which tells them that either the doctor or the commander is actually already gone. McCready, here the assistant commander at the base rather than a pilot, takes command and they electrocute and burn the remaining animals on the base. The first on-screen assimilation is when Bennings is alone with the burnt remains and is burned before he can finish the job. The group now begins to worry how many others have been turned and a blood test is suggested, but fails when they find the uncontaminated blood has been destroyed. The group knows it can only have been Commander Gary or Doc Copper, and after an argument and the radio man Windows running off to get a gun in self-defense, they change leadership. Norris is suggested, but McCready is eventually chosen as the new leader. Fuchs, who has taken over Blair's duties, wanders off after someone cuts the lights in the lab and his burnt remains are eventually found. Nalls and McCready go to investigate McCready's shack, but Nalls comes back alone with torn clothes of McCready's and the team decides that he must have been taken over. Even as they attempt to keep him out, McCready breaks through a storage window and Norris has a heart attack during the altercation. Copper tries to use a defibrillator on Norris only for his body to open up and his transformation kill the doctor. McCready burns the body and then watches the head try to escape on its own until he burns that too. While who takes over is eventually the same, many of the events are different, drastically so in the movie with the amount of action and death that takes place compared to the book at this point. The men of Big Magnet are going mad with paranoia and trust is an all-time low. This leads to the cook named Kinner being murdered, but also to have shown to have already been assimilated. McCready figures out that any part of the thing organism will be its own entity and uses a heated up wire to test the blood of each man one at a time. 
A staggering 14 of them proved to have been infected as they brutally beat them to death and ripped them apart. The book goes out of its way to say how sadistic this is, as even though the men have makeshift blowtorches and electrical rods, they use their hands to rip these things apart. These guys end up enjoying this aspect of it. The remaining men now know they have to go test the isolated Blair and find not him, but what the alien is in its natural form. A blue humanoid creature with three red eyes and worm-like hair. The creature was able to squeeze under the door and therefore move around the camp at will. It had built a gravity-defying backpack it was going to use to leap across the ocean and infect civilization at large, but it's killed when McCready lures it out of the shack and burns it with a blowtorch fashioned into a flamethrower. The men realize in horror just how close it was to being done and ready to leave. Movie McCready also figures out that each cell of this organism is its own entity and also uses the exact same test method by using a hot wire to test the collected blood. He's attacked by Clark, who he shoots and kills, but unlike the book, Clark turns out to be human. The book has 14 members turn, including Gary, who they suspected, but here it's only Palmer who changes and kills Windows before being destroyed. This event leaves only Childs, McCready, Nulls, and Gary to go test Blair. They go to test him to find out he's been turned at some point, but he isn't there. Only a spaceship that he was building to escape, which the men obviously blow up. Power's knocked out in the camp, and the men realize the thing wants to freeze and be rescued eventually, so they blow up the remaining camp until they're underground where the power generator is. Nulls dies or is assimilated off screen, and we see Gary killed directly by Blair Thing, who is stalking him in human form. It changes into a mass of everything you can think of, but McCready is able to blow it up before finding a wandering child's. The two men share a drink and wait to see what happens. The endings of both mediums are drastically different, with only two survivors in the film, 14 men changing during the book test, and the means in which the thing wants to escape. Other differences throughout include the thing being discovered to be telepathic in the book, it having an actual form instead of the movie always having it mid-transformation or already assimilated, and characters being mostly similar in name only. So, which one is better and what are their legacies? I'd say that objectively the film is better. It takes all the main themes of the book with isolation, paranoia, and the main crux of the monster being able to assimilate creatures, but gives it much better characters and some of the greatest special effects ever put to screen. Carpenter, Cundy, Morricone, and the actors all being masters of their craft outweigh Campbell being an admittedly great writer and editor, but ultimately an awful human being. The story was adapted three times technically, with 1951's The Thing from Another World, 1972's Horror Express, yeah, really, look it up. And of course, today's film. The film would get a prequel, but since it's based on the Norwegian camp that doesn't exist in the novella, it doesn't count as an adaptation. The full manuscript and extended version of Who Goes There, Frozen Hell, was published in 2019. The 1982 movie has had a much larger impact than the first two adaptations, even with the Howard Hawks production being considered a 50s-era sci-fi classic. It was adapted in sequel form with a 2002 video game, had the aforementioned prequel, had awesome toys created for it, a short line of comic books, and even had its own movie novelization written by Alan Dean Foster and released in 1982 along with the movie. Foster used Lancaster's original script as the film wasn't completed in time and had a lot of fun differences. Fuchs is killed by the thing with an axe instead of burning. Doc and Mac find tapes at the Norwegian camp to tell the whole story. Bennings, McCready, and Childs chase the dogs who have all become things to kill them only to have Bennings die in the battle. Windows is actually named Sanders. Copper survives the Norris thing only to be killed by the Palmer thing, and the ending is radically different. I won't spoil exactly what that is if you choose to seek it out, but I highly recommend you do. While the adaptation isn't the closest to the source material, we were given one of the greatest horror movies of all time by simply using the basic outline and underlying fears generated by the book. Have you read any version of the novella? Which is your favorite version of the thing? Let us know in the comments.